All right, we're back at AWP 2018. I'm Rich Folley, you're watching PBS Books coverage of this amazing event, brought to you by PBS's The Great American Read series, coming to TV screens very soon. And I'm with Nathan Englander right now, who's the author of Dinner at the Center of the Earth, a, no a novel that is a, a bit of a departure for you. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about this sort of spy thriller that you put together that has all these other elements in it too, some magical realism, some dream, amazing dream sequences, yeah. some history. That's a, a change for you. Uh, yeah, um, I was saying, for 20 years of loyalty from my publisher, I, I've finally written a book that's not about a rabbi eating toast, is how <laughs> I say it, but it's more, uh, it, this book, it's a, there's a, right to the Hebrew, but a Hebrew term, hafuch al hafuch, the opposite of the opposite. So yeah, I really wanted to explore the Israel-Palestine conflict, which I so want peace in that region, and the failure of peace has so broken my heart, and I wanted to find a way to tell that story and build that story. And it's so loaded and so gigantical, and anyone you're already touching the book, anyone who touches this book, no one comes to it without a, like, a position. You know what I'm saying? Everyone is pretty fierce on the subject. And that's why I wanted to sort of shift genres and mix styles and find a way just to, I just, it goes back to John Gardner, we're so surrounded. I can't even tell you if people can feel it watching, but this is like filled with book lovers. But to go straight to you know, John Gardner and, and on moral fiction, I just wanted a book where people could reflect on story. And, and I knew that it should then be really just super plot driven and character driven so that the politics is sort of a, you know, built inside the engine as opposed to sitting on top of the book. But yes, it's a political thriller and magic realism. It's not realism. the right word, there's so much more to it. Like I think political thriller actually undersells what this novel is to some degree, but it it's definitely has plenty of that in there though. Oh, you're nice, uh, you know, uh, you're nice to say that because for me, it, my agent literally, she's, you know, very British, she made me a pot of tea and she, wanted me to be aware when she read the draft to like let me know of that element. But yes, back to me being so thinky and literary and Jewy. Uh, yeah, I worked really hard to build this thing. So it's actually, yes, multiple genres and seven timelines. If you're the grad student who wants to take it apart like a watch, uh, I worked really hard to weave a million things in there. So you're nice to acknowledge the super literary part of it. I'm just, it's really fun for me for the first time in my career to see myself on a list with like, you know, Le yeah, Le Carre yeah, yeah. and Lee Child. Yeah. I was like, ooh, I'm a... <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, it's well, really fun. Well, before long, right? You yeah, know, yeah. It's all these other festivals. Well, let's talk about the, some of the, the, the two main characters, Prisoner Z, who's an American spy for the Mossad, and then you've got the general, yes. who is, is based on Ariel Sharon, who spent a long period of time in most of this book in, in a coma, yes. having these incredible dreams, these, these like rich, yeah. colorful magical dream. That's sort of, yeah, the magic realist history yeah. of the conflict through his coma. But uh, yeah, uh, thanks for that. Those are the two gigantical elements of this book. So Prisoner Z is, is based, uh, I was on book tour in Israel and headed to the airport in the front of the newspaper was the story of Prisoner X, who was real and Australian guy who'd moved to Israel, who joined the Mossad. Basically, uh, thank you to Kafka. We can say Kafka-esque and save 20 minutes of explaining. <laughs> but he literally, we didn't, he had been sort of disappeared into the system. We didn't hear about this person until he had hung himself. So I saw it in his secret cell. I thought, here's a man who didn't live until he was dead. And you know, there was no cell from whence to hang himself until the moment of hanging. And I thought about you know, the conflict. And I thought, what does it take for someone to move from Australia to Israel, to adopt a country, to adopt an ideology, to be so dedicated that he joins the Mossad, this like secret, you know, terrifying spy service and does deep cover as a coward that's really frightening. And then he'd flipped, this guy had turned. And back to that, I, we know the reason people turn, they've been blackmailed or weakness of character or, you know, passed over for a promotion. All, all, we know all the historical reasons people flip as spies, I thought, what would it take to flip someone through empathy? Like what if he flipped because he just felt for the other side? And that's when I had one side of the book and then you talked about the general, which is the other and why the general, you know, Ben Gurion is Ben Gurion in this book and Arafat is Arafat. You call him by name. Yeah, everyone. But not Sharon. Yeah, because it's not Sharon because back to having, back to wanting people to reflect and to be able to really consider the conflict through story and through character. You know what, Sharon is, He's too loaded for me as character. That is, the people who support him, support him for his warring and his battles and the times he saved Israel, and the people who loathe him 
loathe him for the same thing, the people he killed and, you know, the Kibya massacre of Sabra and Chatila. And I thought, I need to build my own character. But, but why I built such a loaded character, why that is because we know that people who adopt back to empathy, people who believe in peace because they feel for the other side. When I think of Sharon in real life, this is a man who really believed in greater Israel, the father of the settlements, like a fierce fighter. And I thought before his coma, like, you know, I, I was heartbroken when Rabin was killed, but even Sharon, like a warrior, a greater Israel person, he pulled out of Gaza. And I never, I could never get that out of my head, which is I think even someone who wasn't doing it out of feeling or out of kindness or saying, oh, the Palestinians deserve, you know, independence, who are we to occupy him? All the political stuff everybody is aware of. I thought this man made a move because peace was the next word of fight that he, like, I really wanted to explore that notion of peace as strategy, because I think, I'm a believer in peace as the only answer. I, I don't even understand how they're, it's almost but bizarre to say degree, it. To some degree, you're guessing like at where his, maybe his mindset was at. Do you think there are others out there that like, because like, you explore this so well in the yes. book, this idea that maybe there was another strategy that was less of being that sort of legendary battle or that yeah. fighter. Yeah, oh sure. But I it mean, re yeah. it requires like this, this other people that I don't see right now yes. in the world. Yes. Where are they? How do we get there? Like. You, you know, I, uh, I, hope, I hope the gray hair is starting to show up. Uh, you know, I hope people can see it watching at home. But this is the first time I'm finally old enough to have watched, like, to watch history recede, to watch something change. So if, you know, the two of us sitting here now, if I'm like, I believe in peace, which I've said, people are probably cackling at home. It seems so impossible right now, just unattainable. And I moved to Jerusalem in 1996 to be part of the priest process. I lived there for five years. It was such an exciting time. And I guess when you say, where are those people? I believe they're out there. And I, I just don't want even the memory of the possibility to recede. That's another reason I wrote this book. I, I moved there for peace. I want my peace back. You know, I really do. Yeah. And so, you know what? I think those people are out there in much greater numbers. And as we see in so many conflicts around the world, it takes a lot of good people to build good things and really a few to tear it down. So I think those people who believe in the process are far greater in number than we might know. Yeah, and the heartbrokenness that you talked about earlier does show up on these pages and the idea of empathy on both sides, right? I mean, it's like such an important part of everything you're talking about, but it just bleeds from these pages as well. This idea of understanding the other side and in fact making decisions sometimes that seem contrary to your stated goals, right? I mean, but because you think it's for the greater good, something larger than even your own goals. That, those, that, that seems like such an important element of this book. Well, you know, I, I mean, I, it's not just Israel and Palestine. There's such a focus on the Gaza conflict in this book. And that sort of sums it up for me, the, the heartbreak of it. It's almost like a movie series. If you put Gaza War into a Google search, they have names, you know, Grapes of Wrath, Cast Lead. You know, right now, and I, you know, depending on your politics, pick a side to start with. But right now, you know, Hamas and the Palestinians in, of Gaza, like they're preparing for the next war. Israel's preparing for the next war. I was like, how can that be an okay cycle that it's just a con you know, continuous circle of the ending of one war, the rebuilding, the plotting for the next, you know, Israel's building a wall, you know, the, their tunnels come in from Gaza. Now Israel's building a wall underground. The, the absurdity of it, even as somebody who likes words, a wall goes up. I don't even know that there is a word for a wall that goes down, but they're building this underground wall now. And that notion of, yes, like that it will be a default, like the seasons, a constant cycle of violence that can't be okay. And I really just wanted to look at it, which is part of the circles on the cover and the, you know, back to the timelines that you were nice about. I, I really wanted to capture. That's cool. I didn't know that about yeah. the circles. For the me, government. that's, yeah, it yeah. feels like the, you know, the book is just circle after circle because that's what I can't get over. I, that cycle has to get broken. So what, what, how did your experience in Israel, your, your own experience in Israel affect that book? And what did you see while you were there? Did you see this conflict up close? Uh, yeah, I, <laughs> That's the longest I'll ever pause, but I, I you know, I sometimes sort of say, like, it, it, it's, uh, it's almost not polite to acknowledge. I, I, I use, like, September 11th. I, was, I had just moved back to New York for that. Like, you don't claim to survive it uptown or in the Bronx or in Minnesota. Like, you need to be right there. Yes, I lived in the heart of Jerusalem during a lot of violence, but, uh, yeah, I... And so you felt it, and it was there, and it oh, was there every were, day. Uh, it, 
it, not that it was every day. It was very much my neighborhood that was blowing up. And my, yes, the cafeteria that I reference in this book like that, you know, blew up and coffee shops with my market. A lot of stuff was blowing up and I'm not claiming that. But uh, you know what? You may you want to talk about fear, which is a big part of this book. When, the, when I first moved there and things were blowing up, I can't even tell you that it was horrible and the loss of life was tragic, but we were working to build something. And that's really what I was trying to get at in here, which is it wasn't scary to me. People, you know, in, in America, we make choices. You know what I'm saying? Right now we have 33,000 gun deaths here or something. You make choices of what you're willing to sacrifice life for. And I really, I wasn't talking about being a combat soldier. I'm saying going to my coffee shop, I was ready to die for peace. I thought we're building something beautiful and we're trying to build this together. And if there are enemies of this peace, then, you know, I'm not looking to die, but I'm willing to be a part of it. I want to be here for it. And I can tell you when the fear set in, which is, you know, what I'm at the time that I'm looking at Intifada 2, it's sort of when I understood that no, that that piece wasn't going to happen. It was after, you know, Sharon 1 and Intifada 2 started that I can really almost pinpoint the moment where this is terrible and this is our day to day and we must continue to turn to fear for me. And that's when I said, when I sort of felt everyone's dying for, you know, for nothing, for naught, because the peace is not coming. And that's, yeah, that is well, distinctly where, where when it got find, scary for me. Where do you find empathy when your coffee shop or your cafeteria is blowing up in, you know, in your neighborhood? I mean, where does, where do you not just get angry? Uh, uh, um, wow, we're going super deep and thank you for that. But you know what? I can answer that honestly. Uh, yeah, as I said, because you get to, this book is about categorization. Like what got clear to me when I was living there that I was like a Jewish guy living in Jerusalem and my holy site's the Temple Mount. And on the other side, you know, in the same neighborhood, on the same street of Palestinians living in Al-Quds and their, you know, holy site is Ram al-Sharif. Like it's about differing realities and about how we all make frameworks. So in answer to your question, I picked my side and my side was peace. So I, I didn't see that back to that that's not all palestinians you know right you know or you know this this idea who's blowing up the coffee shop someone who doesn't believe you know i was on the side of peace and yes i'm you know the terror was heartbreak and i'm sure there were moments of extreme anger on both sides but i i guess you're getting you take me right back to the circles if they're you know it's it's trying to decide who started this ancient conflict they're avenging the event this whole book is about that someone avenging the ve the vengeance of the avenging of the vengeance of the victim of the victim i just felt like whoever was behind it we both had it to protect the people in the street the, yes i felt on the side of people who want to send their kids to school in the morning healthy and have them come home from yeah. school as we deal with in america every day so there was all coffee, kinds of anger get but a it, coffee yes not to say i'm risking my life you know. yeah but uh, so yeah the anger was at the enemies of peace at those who make violence yeah. Th those were my sides violent and non-violent right uh i'll take you out of that deeper place yes. right now because uh, another part of this book is you're, you're in other countries because the, the prisoner Z is a spy who's been in all these other countries and there's, you, you do these cuts into the life of the spy yes. how he got to this point. And, yes. and there's a lot of that sort of behind the scenes spydom that, and that must have also been sort of fun to write as well. Oh, that was such a joy. It takes, you know, I've been writing for a long time now. I, like, I, I teach at uh, NYU and the graduate writing program. I sometimes tell my students like, uh, um, it takes a long time to recognize if you're having fun, that's okay. I really had a good time exploring that. And as someone who's generally talks about a very specific set of subjects, like I- yeah, Not I, rabbis eating toast. In yeah, no, I got to do a whole, you know, I did a whole long interview about the spy craft in the book. I was like, I can't believe I'm here talking about spy craft. Yeah. But yeah, that fascinated me. And the spy, so that's it. Yes, we talked about Israel a lot now. Most of this book is set in Paris. It's set in Berlin, parts of it in Italy. It's exploring a lot of places and cities that I love. But um, the spy is very much me-like. I, I built him and then I thought, how would I be as a spy? Basically his emergency contact is his mother. It's really, uh, I worked hard on the spy craft and then mixed in a whole bunch of neuroses. So yes, yeah. it's not as, as serious and screamy as I'm being now in my New York way. I, uh, I recognize the balance and there are a lot of, I uh, hope, funny parts around you yeah. know, Tell me about being in over your Tell head. Tell me about your teaching life. Um, I don't think you're screamy, by the way. I okay. think, you know, clearly you, you um, <laughs> love talking about these subject matters and things, but what is it like with your students when you're teaching them and you're talking to them? Because you're getting a lot of passion back from them. How do you channel that and, and help them? What, I mean- Oh God, it's, it's been really rewarding. You know, 
I think I need a few more books to be an old man of letters, a couple more years and a couple more books. But uh, I really, I spend so much time. I mean, what is a writer expert in? I sit a alone in a room all day, maybe with my dog with me. But what I can give them is, is just time, you know, to save parts of the process that took me so long to figure out, to teach them what matters. Yeah, I just find it like sort of a 82% writing psychology. And then I, you know, teach set and stuff and craft. Yeah. But uh, I, I, I love that exchange. And I love being forced to put things into words that were maybe sort of amorphous. You know, how do you, like, what, why does this sentence work? Or, you know, how do I build a routine? All those things that are just, you know, my, most of my reality. And it's lovely to be forced to try to explain the why of, of this really odd job. Well, what I love is that you've given all of your students uh, this, this watch to take apart now, as you talked about earlier, this idea that there's all these pieces and parts that they're going to want to deconstruct and figure out how you did it, how you put all this into one book. Uh, it's a very cool story. Dinner at the Center of the Earth. Nathan Englander, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you. Oh, what a treat. Bringing Thanks for having me. Bringing yourself to our set. Thank you so much. Oh, excellent.